Dr. Donald Media Summit. My name is Jenna Wilson, and I have the honor of being the event director of this year's summit. Beside me is our assistant event director, Lynn Brancato. <laughs> Starting off, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to everybody involved in this event. Our panelists, moderator, and career connectors have all dedicated their time to be with us today. Thank you to the School of Communication, Media, and the Arts faculty and staff members, the alumni office, the alumni that have joined us today, and SUNY Oswego's officer in charge, Dr. Mary Toll. I would also like to personally thank our faculty director for this year's summit, Dr. David Kreider. You have been an absolute asset to this team, as well as a wonderful men mentor to both myself and Melinda over these past few months. We are extremely grateful for your insight and guidance. We would also like to acknowledge the summit's first ever faculty director, Jerry Condra, who sadly passed away last summer. Jerry was instrumental in transforming the media summit into the signature event it is today. We recognize his dedication to our Oswego community and are forever grateful for his contributions. I would like to give a special thanks to the student executive board that we have had the pleasure of working with over the past few months to plan and prepare for this day. I would also like to thank the student-run media orgs involved with today's event, as well as all of the students working to broadcast the event for those who are not able to join us in person today. You all have done an incredible job, and the Media Summit would not be possible without you. In case of an emergency, please make sure to identify the closest exit from your seat. If you need to leave for any reason, please do so quietly and respectfully. Restrooms are located directly outside of the theater. Please remember to silence your cell phones if you have not already. If you need to record your attendance for coming to this event, there are flyers with QR codes displayed in the back at the end if you would prefer. Lastly, a networking opportunity is available to you all immediately after our panel discussion in Tyler Hall Art Gallery. These successful alumni with us today are excited to speak to you about their career paths since graduating from SUNY Oswego. At this time, it is our great pleasure to give a warm welcome to SUNY Oswego's officer in charge, Dr. Mary Toll. What an honor. I have to say, uh, now Fritz is out there, he was the dean when I was hired. 2014 was my first media summit, and every year it gets better and better. So I'm very excited to be here and honored to be on this stage today to welcome you here to the Lewis B. O'Donnell Media Summit number 18 which is great, right? So the students who organize this continue to impress me every year, as do the faculty, staff, and alumni who help get this thing going, because it takes a whole team, a whole crew. Quite literally, you can see everybody back here. It's also in the front, right? So thank you for the work that you do on this. Whether you're here in person or you're watching via the live stream, live stream we are happy you're here. And there's a bunch of pros, right, out in the audience, so we're thrilled that you're here so that you will take this forward as well. This year's theme, Reaching for the Summit, Underrepresentation in Sports Media, is great. Given that we're in the 50th anniversary since the passage of the Title IX that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, there's been progress, for sure, in increased partici participation of girls, according to Cheryl Cookie at Purdue University, participation of school-age girls in sports increased from 1 in 27 to 1 in 3 in 2021. I happen to be one of those folks. If it weren't for Title IX, I wouldn't have been able to participate in the number of sports I participated in. And actually, I have a knee brace on because I blew my knee in soccer, and these are the lifelong benefits of being an athlete. So that's okay. I wouldn't have been in be able to go to college without it. So it really is what, what got me to where I am today. So when we think about that, there's more progress that needs to be made. Yes, there's a lot more participation, but Cookie in that same study found that the coverage of women's sports in the media has hovered around 5% since 1980, 40 years, 5%, about the same. So we also have to think then about how women are represented in the media, when they're represented, and how it's woefully, influ woefully imbalanced compared to the coverage of male counterparts. So as an example, I know it's pre-COVID, so it feels like a decade ago, but in 2017, Simone Biles was participating in Dancing with the Stars. Not a fan of the show, because I just don't watch it, but you couldn't miss the uh, output of what happened, right? She didn't smile enough. She's not emotionally connecting. Meanwhile, this is like one of the best athletes in the world ever, and she doesn't smile enough, and her response was beautiful. You don't win gold medals with smiles, right? 
How many men have been told to smile more as an athlete? Think about that. So then we have to think about the controversy. The greatest of all time tennis star. Who am I talking about? Yep, I hear it. Serena Williams. The controversy of wearing a black bodysuit to play tennis. For her health, no less. The French Tennis Federation, after that, said, we need new dress codes. We can't do this anymore. Okay. Then we think about more recent time, right? Because that was Serena in 2018. Now we're thinking about Olympic coverage and the B-roll that was used during the Olympic coverage. What were the stories being told? How did the female athlete bounce back after having a baby? While local news run features when you're talking about patriotic na nail color or how amazing their nail polish didn't chip during their performance. That's just a few examples of the scrutiny that women athletes face compared to their male counterparts. So even with the passage of Title IX, we have witnessed an overwhelming struggle for gender and racial equality in the sports field. When we think about it, sports are vital. Personal story, I said it already, I couldn't have gone to college without sports. So yeah, sports are very important. We're talking about revenue, we're talking about contributing to numerous media industry, tourism, merchandising, but also the immense impact that it has on the individual and how we can really uh, be able to kind of excel through those opportunities. So whether it's temperament, fashion, Title IX, sexual orientation, trans rights, equal pay, or the general marginalization of coverage by major media outlets, women and people of color are kicking down the proverbial, excuse me, proverbial door to spotlight a host of inequities within the wide world of sports. And so, as our panelists will attest, considerable gains still need to be made. We need to think about how sports are covered and what is the content of that coverage. As legendary soccer player Megan Rapino once said, when we, as a nation, put our minds to something, when we truly choose to care about something, change always happens. So let's use today's conversation as one small step in reaching the summit of understanding all the possibilities equitable representation in sports offers. Before I hand over the stage to our moderator, I would like to thank the Media Summit's founder, Lou Borelli, Lou Borelli Jr. Uh, Lou's a great person, he's probably live streaming right now. A 1977 graduate of SUNY Oswego and a pioneer in the cable television industry, Lou wanted to find a way to honor his longtime Oswego professor, Louis O'Donnell, Doc, as he was fondly known to students. As they made their way, I'm sorry, um, it, he provided students with good advice as they made their way through our university and into the creative world of broadcasting. His legend truly carries on through the different professors and students who have come since then. And thanks to Lou's encouragement and support from another one of Doc's former students, SUNY Oswego alumnus Al Roker, the Media Summit now bears Louis B. O'Donnell's name. We are grateful for Lou and Al's commitment to the Media Summit. For 18 years, we've welcomed leading professionals to campus to tackle some of the most pressing issues facing the media industries. Today, we are very glad this tradition continues and it will well into the future. Before I hand it over, I do wanna mention as, well, as the students did, Jerry Condra. We need to acknowledge as the first faculty director, but also as one of the seminal persons who helped really get this launched into the future as it is now. He, he began his second career as an educator decades after he was in radio TV. We are fortunate to have professors who, who can bring that practical experience in, and he definitely brought it with him. Being able to mentor hundreds of eager broadcasting students along the way. He would be pleased that the Media Summit is still going strong and proud to welcome today's incredible group of distinguished professionals as they dive into this year's program, thinking about how are we reaching for the summit under representation in sports media. So now it's a great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Alif Karim, SUNY Oswego class of 2018. Alif is a former sports director for WDVM TV in Maryland and is currently working as a producer editor for WJZ 13 in Baltimore. Alif's time as sports director has allowed him to connect with communities in Western Maryland as well as the greater Washington DC area covering local sports from the high school level all the way to the pros. If you haven't seen some of his stuff, go online and look. Coverage of, of the, uh, the young woman who was the first football, American football athlete, to play a non-punter or kicker. Great story. Anyway, <laughs> just a little plug for you, Alif. In addition, Alif has, has had the privilege of being able to cover the Washington Nationals as they hoisted the 2019 World Series title 
as well as the reveal and impact of Washington, D.C.'s NFL franchise as they adopted their new name, the Commanders. As a broadcasting and mass communication major at Oswego, he took on many different responsibilities for our student television station, WTOP. Alif, it is a pleasure to have you back on campus to host the 18th annual Louis B. O'Donnell Media Summit. Floor is yours. Thank you guys so much. It, it truly is an honor, Professor. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming, too. Um, I do want to start by first pointing out that the conversation that Professor Toole mentioned, this is the extension of that conversation. We draw from our experiences as professionals in the industry dealing with different circumstances, good and bad, to help us guide what we know now for the future. So allow me to introduce the wonderful panelists. I'm going to start with Morgan Rump. She is currently, and let me get this correct, the Chief Marketing Officer for C-Suite Executive Solutions, a 2017 grad. Me and Morgan were awesome enough to connect during college, and during her time in college, she did wonderful things wearing multiple hats, especially as sports director for WTOP. A round of applause for Morgan, if you will, please. Our next panelist, Day Ellis, Associate Director and Associate Producer for CBS Sports, a 2004 grad. A day you may know has launched an incredible series through CBS Sports that highlights athletes and underrepresented athletes in underrepresented communities in sports that may have low representation and profiles them in the work that they do to impact their communities, but to also impact their own personal communities, building out coverage and building out outreaches that may be done. A round of applause for him, please. <laughs> Next, Donna Goldsmith, consultant and former COO, Chief Operating Officer for WWE. She has spent, even before that time in the NBA, working in multiple executive level marketing roles during the Michael Jordan, Larry Bird eras, pioneering a lot. A 1982 grad, a round of applause for Donna, please. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Yaoya Foriata, producer for CBS Sports, a 2005 grad, and actually, fun enough, Ade and Yao spent some time together in college here in Oswego, so the ties keep bringing us back here as the winds of change, the winds of us, we go bring us all back together eventually. So a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> and so I wanted to go back to what I mentioned about the conversation. This conversation that we will have on this panel is not meant to find solutions. We are simply here to evoke the conversation for all of you to then go back and have within yourselves, among yourselves, and hopefully to bring up these conversations too in spaces that need it. So I wanted to point out something that I found doing my research for this panel, and I wanted to get it exactly right, so I'm gonna read off this note here real quick. In 2021, the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sports released a report, basically a report card highlighting or grading the practices of over 100 newspapers and publications across all different circulation sizes. Um, surprisingly, a lot of sports media is still white and is still male dominated. This topic of discussion has been brought up constantly, is still being brought up, and I guess a question for everyone on this panel, the publications in question are being asked to do more, but have you guys seen through your experiences whether or not they're trying to make that effort? Um, yeah, for, I guess for the most part, um, I see a lot of companies, platforms, networks uh, doing their, do, putting, putting their best foot forward trying to make sure that diversity is something that's, uh, um, that's pointed at their corporations. Um, but, in, in, you know, at, at, on the surface level, you know, you see it on Twitter. Um, but, you know, that's still, we still don't really see the uh, representation, rep representation that needs to happen uh, within our, uh, our industry. Um, even other industries as well. I have a friend that uh, works at Twitter, and uh, we had a discussion about, he work, he's working in partnerships. And we had a discussion about how when he goes to these corporations to discuss partnerships and you know, their social media teams, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of our social media teams and even on TV, we use a lot of, uh, you know, we, 
black people and brown people are people who create culture on Twitter and on these networks, particularly black women. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen um, It's Giving or um, uh, what are the other colloquialisms you guys, you guys use? But it's, it's all over Twitter, and you see a lot of these networks using them. But when you dive deep into it, a lot of the social media teams and even people that are at the networks, there's nobody that looks like you and me there. Um, so it's important, I guess, to try to you know, infiltrate, because people are, being, are, benef are benefiting from um, our culture and uh, the people that we put out there for, for certain sports, NFL. You know, NFL, 70% of the NFL is, is black, but a lot of the people we, we just don't, we don't represent, there's not re represent, representation enough in the media and on other cross, other platforms. So I think it's, that's the key. I think people are really, I guess, putting the, the effort forward per se, but we're not seeing uh, the results maybe as fast as we, as we would like. You know, um, we've been at this for a long time. It's an ongoing discussion that's been happening for, you know, years and years. And, you know, slowly but surely things are getting better, but we need to, we need to be more, more action put forward. Right. I think from a, a business side, the back of the house, the people you don't see as much, there, are, there is more change being made. I mean, for example, Kim NG or Ng, she runs the Miami Marlins now. And then you have the woman who runs the NBA Players Association is an African-American woman. Um, and, I, and I've said to these guys that I, I haven't had that glass ceiling. I mean, I've been very lucky and have not had issues and have grown in the organizations. But again, this is behind the scenes. It's not as much, you know, you have the Pam Olivers, you have some of the, the broadcasters that are um, people of color, but, you, but you're absolutely right. It's not where it should be. And just to piggyback on what uh, these two have said, I've seen some changes in the last couple of years, uh, especially since, you know, 2020. Um, and one thing that I've been a part of with CBS is I've attended the NABJ convention at, uh, C with CBS since 2018, and that's something that's a breeding ground for a lot of uh, people of color to want to get into the business, whether it's news, sports, or, or other platforms as well. And uh, if, you, if you look at a lot of the sports journalists, the sports broadcasters in the last couple of years, you've seen a, a more concerted effort. But the big thing is, is the jobs that people desire like the bottom line is that people stick around in that job forever. I mean, if you look at some of the faces of the franchises, don't have to go into anybody, name in particular, because I'm not singling anybody out, but a lot of those people who do those prestigious events, they've been around for a really long time, so it's a good job, why not? If you somebody who does a great job and can be a person who's the face of a franchise, you know, why would you leave that spot? So I think uh, we've seen more up and comers through the years, but as far as the grander scheme of things, like Yao said earlier, 70% of the NFL is black, but you know, a lot of the people who are asking the, the athletes questions, you know, they might not have that same sensitivity with asking a certain question because they don't identify as uh, African American or a person of color. So I think that having a person of color uh, more prevalent in those spaces could definitely help things because you have a certain sensitivity that you're prone to, that you're aware of, that you might not have. And not just, you know, because it's done out of malice, it's just something that you naturally don't think about, you know what I mean? So I think it's very important that the numbers get better. They have been getting better, but more and more representation is def definitely vital to, uh, to fix the solution. And I think what's helpful with this is that we're having these conversations and it's no longer taboo to want to be inclusive. For me, when I was in minor league baseball, in 2019, there was an initiative, a huge push across all minor league baseball affiliates to start a whole Latinx program. There was rebranding across the board. All teams were getting a Latinx name. They wanted press releases sent out in both English and Spanish. We're sitting at the table for the team I worked at, and I look around. Every single person at this table is white. Not a single person at this table spoke Spanish. How are we trying to encompass an entire culture where no one who lives that is sitting here? So I'm proud of myself, and I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I hope that everyone in this room would have enough realization to do exactly what I did, where I made sure my voice was heard in saying, we should go get Luis, who is of Latin descent and speaks Spanish as his first language, who is our front desk manager, and have him be in this room. It's his voice that we need to listen to. So I'm so glad we're starting these conversations, continuing and growing these conversations because as uncomfy as they may be, you just grow when you get outside of your comfort zone. 
Yeah. Off the initial discourse between examples and context provided, you can tell, and I'm sure you can observe, that there's clear, clearly an issue in sports media that still needs to be addressed. Um, my next question for Donna and Morgan, right? Donna, I wanted to piggyback off what you said. You had, some would say, the ideal circumstance, right? You did not have that many glass ceilings. The rooms you were in had women in them, had people of color. But Morgan, in contrast, you ran into a situation where you had to speak up in what should be a common sense scenario. And you've also done incredible work, but also tiring and pressure-filled work in Idaho. So the contrast of both your careers, through both your examples and experiences, have you seen enough being done to elevate women's sports and also women in media? Is enough being done to, to put those faces and to put those voices on display and on a platform? Well, let's talk first about the women on the court, on the field, wherever they're playing. They don't get the coverage, the television coverage, the sponsorships, the advertising. It's just not there for them. And because it's not there for them, this becomes very circuitous. The, the, the networks, the leagues, they can't put as much into it because there's not as much money behind it. And so it's important for, for example, the NBA, who supports the WNBA. The team ha teams have part ownership, but NBA owns part of those teams. They need to do a better job of promoting the women, of talking about what, the, what are the women doing when they're not on the court. And, and all of those kind of conversations will drive more interest to the women. Um, it's getting better. I mean, you look at the the salaries that the NBA players make versus the WNBA players. It's from here to here. Now, having said that, the NBA players, the first year an NBA player plays, he's gonna make about $900,000 as a rookie. A WNBA player makes about $75,000. That is changing. Will it ever be the same? Not until there's more dollars behind it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I say as a very positive experience, Look at soccer, women's soccer. We were, she was talking about women's soccer before. The women, they sued. And now $24 million was granted to them as well as a new collective bargaining agreement. So is it possible? It is. Is it a little bit of an uphill battle? Probably. Um, but I, I think you know, by doing more to promote these women, it certainly will be helpful from a on the court, in the field standpoint. Yeah. Some, coming from the perspective of being a sports anchor, being a sports reporter, working for a minor league baseball team, the things that I have felt and seen is the fact that to connect with the younger generation, I recently saw a TikTok where it was someone venting about how girls who love sports are so annoying and they are the most annoying people to talk to and all they do is spit out all these statistics and all of these facts. And then I saw a reaction video to that, and I've never connected with something more of the fact that women and girls who like sports have to do that. Because the second a guy finds out that you enjoy sports, you're being grilled with questions, you are being asked, and you have to know all of these things. You're expected to be the smartest person in the room, and the second you misspeak, the second you get something wrong, your credibility is gone, and it takes that much more to get it back. And on the flip side of that, when you look around, there's been many times in my professional career where I've been the only female at a table where big decisions are being made. And for me, it was realizing that I was hired, and I hope all of you, when you get into your professional careers, realize you're hired for a reason. You are in that seat because you deserve it, and you're qualified. So my big stress to you is make sure your voice is heard. Don't sit there and feel that you can allow people to railroad over top of what you're saying, because what you're saying matters. And to add to that, you know, anybody who criticizes if women have a place in sports, you know, I challenge all those guys if they have daughters, you know, what would you say to your daughter if your daughter tells you she wants to be in sports media? Are you going to tell your daughter, no, you got to stick to this role? You wouldn't do that. So why would you do that to someone else's daughter? Uh, I just think it's really important for men to embrace women uh, in all aspects of sports media. I, I was telling them backstage, I know women that will roast guys in a sports argument with no problem. Um, but, you know, um, and, you know, guys have, e we're egotistical and we feel a way about, you know, being challenged by women sometimes. I'm sorry, in the grand scheme, me, I don't, I don't have that issue. Um, <laughs> uh, but, I think, like I said earlier, it's, like, it's really important for men to, um, I was saying earlier, we don't, 
in communication, as, as we're all in communication, right? But we don't do a good enough job of listening at all. Um, and we also don't listen, we listen to respond as opposed to listening to hear what the other person is saying, right? So um, when that happens, you know, um, with, the, with guys and girls arguing about sports, like I said, guys tend to get a little more bravado and want to, you know, flex their muscle a little bit, but I, that's not the way to, to, to go about this. We need to be collaborative with it. We need to embrace it. And why wouldn't you embrace an, another opinion about sports, which, is, which more, more often than not is factual when they come with facts? Because as she, as she said, a lot of women are very tenacious about sports and uh, they're very knowledgeable about, even more knowledgeable than a lot of guys because they're, they're like they have a standard that they have to hold, uphold because, you know, their, their credentials and their credibility will automatically come into question. So like I said, for us gentlemen, it's very important for us to embrace women in the sports field so we can have a, a, a better industry, honestly, so. So just to take a different spin on it, I didn't have any problem. And let me tell you all here, I had zero knowledge of sports, zero. I mean, I got my job at the NBA by answering an ad in the New York Times, because I'm old, and back then there were ads in the newspaper. Right, Betsy? <laughs> <laughs> right, Fritz? <laughs> I answered an ad, I got the job because I had a marketing background. I got the job at World Wrestling Entertainment because I had the job at the NBA. I was named second most powerful woman in sports. I gotta tell you something. I followed sports carefully because it was part of my job. Did I love and die for sports? No but it was my job. And I learned it just like any of these guys learned it. And nobody pushed me down before because of it. And by the way, I have a really big mouth. So nobody is gonna tell me to shut up and nobody is not going to listen to me because I'll just talk right over them. So I had, I have to say, a very different positive experience. I did work for loony Vince McMahon and he's crazy. But that has nothing to do with the fact that I was listened to and heard. And I just, I just bring it up because it's atypical. Um, but it's important that, that people understand it's not always the case. Right. You're also no. from New York. And that's and I'm from New York. <laughs> New York City in the house. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys bring up those examples. And you know, especially for you, bringing up the idea of embracing. So fun fact time, you guys. In 1981-82, that was the first season when women's national championships were incorporated into the NCAA, right? So that's as far back as you can go if you look at the stats. Um, this past year, really in August of this year, was the first time when ABC said, we're finally going to broadcast the women's national basketball title game. We've come a long way. There's still clearly a long way to go. But like Donna mentioned, there's some good to look forward to. Going back to the idea of embracing, now, some more context. You guys might remember in 2021, Naomi Osaka dropping out of the French Open. What you might not remember is that the day before, she was fined $15,000 because she had skipped out on media appearances. And so bringing that topic up, I'm now moving to a conversation that centers around sports, coverage with sports, but centered around topics that affect society, for this case, mental health. And mental health often gets brought up in terms of the idea of burnout that may affect our workrooms, that may affect our personal lives. And so my question for all of you guys is, is, is media, and specifically sports media, are they prepared, are they aptly covering this type of mental health coverage, especially when it relates to athletes? I feel like it's getting better. Uh, I think mental health is being more embraced and acknowledged maybe 10 years ago if uh, an athlete didn't kind of fit the mold of what you expected of an athlete, you know, they, oh, that, that athlete's crazy, or that athlete's a malcontent, or that athlete, you know, you can't win with that athlete. And I think that there's been a definite emphasis in embracing uh, a mental, mental health. Um, you know, a guy like Brandon Marshall, who had an NFL career, he's somebody who was very open about his mental health. And, you know, there was a time where people thought that Brandon Marshall was you know, a malcontent or a bad teammate, but he had a lot of things going on that he wanted to express. And I think that now we're getting much better in sports media with embracing and being aware of how important it is to not just, because you can work out your mind, uh, work out your, your calves and work out your biceps. And if you tear your ACL, you can see that you tore your ACL. Or if you twist an ankle, you can see that you twist an ankle. But what's going on inside your head you can't see that, and a lot of times that, you know, there are things going on inside of there that there's an injury, just like you would fix a broken ankle or fix a twisted knee. 
you know, mental health is equally important as well because you can't perform on a torn ACL or a torn Achilles. And if you're there mentally, that impacts your performance as well. Um, Kevin, Kevin Love and De DeMar DeRozan have been very vocal about this, these NBA athletes as well, about you know, just embracing men mental health. And they've had their own mental health issues that they've been dealing with since they've been professionals. You guys remember Ron Artest? Anybody? Nobody knows who Ron Artest is? Oh, yeah. oh okay, cool, all right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was gonna say. Um, well, for those that, Ron Artest, you know, um, had a lot of issues in the league, um, fighting and uh, a lot of technical fouls, arguing with refs, and you know, it, was, it turned out he had, a, he, had, he had mental issues. And when it was found out that he was uh, going to therapy, you know, it was a long running joke. It's probably 10, 15 years ago, I'm assuming. Um, when they won the championship in 2010, um, with Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Um, uh, when they interviewed him, he said, uh, I want to thank my therapist. Um, you know, he was very excited and, you know, I want to thank my therapist. And that was a long running joke um, on social media and within, within just the, the realms of media itself. Um, but I'm so, I'm just very happy that as time has progressed, um, we've, we gotta allow people grace. You know, these athletes are expected to be on 10 at all times. The lights are on at all times, you know what I mean? They have to uh, smile or um, be tenacious. And you know, I think they're human beings at the end of the day, just like us. We all have our bad days where we're just not up to being happy. I don't feel like smiling in your face. I don't feel like shaking your hand today. And I think uh, as media members, um, we have to point that out and also just be a little more gracious and you know, be a little more forgiving because you just never know what people are going through, athlete or you know, civilian, per se. Yeah, and actually, going back to the example of Naomi, right? The tennis writers in question then were mostly male and, and white dominant male, that industry as well. So coming back to the idea of representation, what would increased representation have helped how Naomi was covered back then? Morgan and Donna, I wonder if, what your take is on this. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's easier for uh, women to express issues about mental health, emotional, I mean, people, may, oh, she's emotional. But they're just a little bit more comfortable talking about therapy and, and mental health in general. Now, to, to your point, athletes have to be at that 10. And so you don't hear about it as often, at least in the past you didn't. Now, I think you're both right that it's definitely better now. You're reading articles now about how Michael Phelps said he was in a really bad place. And he, people said, oh, he's smoking pot, he's a mess. No, he needed therapy. Mm -hmm. And even Ronda Rousey now talks about when she tried to commit suicide several years ago. Serena talks about how mental health needs to be priority for her and her family. And then lastly, I even read recently, I mean, talk about Macho, The Rock talked about when he was trying to be a football player many years gone by and he got an injury. Now what am I going to do? He was a wreck and it became an overwhelming mental health issue. So. You know, would it help if someone interviewed him who got it? Of course, but nobody talked about it. It was too, you know, it was quiet. It was taboo. It was completely taboo. Yeah, and I think starting and having those conversations and going past tennis and look at Simone Biles. She was on the biggest stage in the world representing the United States, and she pulled out of two events in the all, and the all-around because of her mental health. But what people weren't realizing, and she came out with it, and I applaud her tenfold for this, is the skills she is doing, no one else in the world is even attempting half of that. Not male, not female. And the things she's doing, if she is not on that 100%, when she is doing these things, she will die. And for her to say, I value not only my mental health and the pressure that has been put on me, but I value my life too, is something that I think the media is changing. And I hope that, you know, as we keep having these conversations, it's going, I think in the workplace, it's way more acceptable for you to call in your boss and say, I'm using a personal day, or I need a mental health day. We're seeing more businesses offer those and have those on part of your uh, calendar of things that you can take. So I think just continuing to have the conversation and be open and the people who are brave enough to share their experiences because, again, you don't have to. No one has to parade around this banner that they go to therapy or they're struggling and they have a hard time. But at the same time, it's that day in and day out of 
You never know what someone else is going through. And I think as journalists, if you take that to heart and you're always thinking like, there's something beyond this, this person is so much more than an athlete, they're a human, and we just continue to have these conversations, I think things will evolve and get to maybe where we're hoping they do. Yeah, and I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, like you just said perfectly, that these athletes are human beings. And I think that gets lost. They think, oh, we're just, they're just here for our entertainment. Just entertain me, clown, and just, you know, shut up and, you know, do what you do. I'm here for entertainment. I don't care about you personally. But we forget about that these are all human beings at the end of the day. Yeah, and that actually is a wonderful point that you bring up that segues into what I was going to mention. Morgan, you mentioned about pushing against the stigmas, right? In some cases, athletes have to push back, and by extension, sports media should as well. We've all heard the phrase, I would hope, the phrase stick to sports has been tossed around often when it comes to athletes speaking about their personal social justice preferences and also any kind of activism that they may be involved in. And so the conversation gets brought up, well, how, how should media cover activism? Where is the responsibility that media has towards activism and also towards understanding the, the knot that is athletes and their activism that they choose to follow. These athletes have a platform. And now more than certainly when I was younger, between Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and the fact that they're, their sponsorship relationships, they have a platform. I think they should talk about their issues. Yeah. I mean, you look back and, and in many, many years ago, you had like Muhammad Ali in the 60s didn't want to um, be drafted because of his religious issues. It became a huge issue. Or you had the Olympians in, I think it was 68, who stood up for human rights and wore a black glove and, and well, they were ushered out and they couldn't be Olympians anymore. And then you have Colin Kaepernick now. These are important messages. Yeah. And if they have a platform, I say they should be the ones that are allowed yeah. to express their their concerns, their their passions. It's it's a place for them to do it. And look, you, you can't get crazy. I mean, we talked about it a little before with Kanye. That guy was off his rocker. But, but you can do it in a good way as well and yeah. make your point heard. Yeah. And, and so to bounce off of that, I guess for sports media specifically, what is their responsibility in this, right? What is their responsibility in terms of what they've done so far in terms of coverage and what they should be doing moving forward in terms of allow, like covering these athletes better and how they approach their own social justice initiatives? Yeah, I feel like if an athlete has an initiative, it's important to uh, let that athlete use their platform, you know, because like I said a little while ago, that they're human beings too. So if an athlete wants to protest something, that's if Jim Smith, who's a barber, can protest, why can't, you know, LeBron James protest? He's a human being just like Jim Smith, the barber is. So we shouldn't say that the athletes have to, because nobody is just one thing. You know, LeBron James is a heck of a basketball player, but he's more than just a basketball player. When he walks out the arena, he has a wife, he has a family to, you know, to attend to, just like everybody else does. So we can't just expect to put athletes and entertainers in these boxes. And as the media, if they have something that is a worthy cause that they feel like they want to speak up, we should definitely take a part in amplifying that to show that, you know, they're more than just a basketball player or a football player or a track and field athlete, that there's complex. And as human beings, everybody has more than just one thing that they are. I took the word out of my mouth, so your point was, was made. I was just gonna say, you know, stick to sports is just an irresponsible statement because we are, we're, we're not what we do. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a producer, but you know, I, it's, a whole, it's a whole seven, eight more layers to me. And when you, when you dig down, there's so many things that I am involved with and I love. Like, so to say stick to sports is just really irresponsible. And e even I feel like, you know, with, with athletes, media has to fall in line with them coming out on their platform and speaking about their social issues. Because, you know, media is, media is always the vehicle that gets the word out for everything. So why, why shouldn't they be involved with LeBron's saying whatever he has to say about, you know, any issue per se, you know? I feel like the media has a, has a responsibility as well to get that, get that out there as well, Parti particularly if um, it's something that can gen generally help the country or help our situation. Uh, the media definitely has a responsibility for that. Yeah. And if there's a Jim Smith in the audience or watching No here, offense. I apologize. <laughs> I wasn't trying to single you out. I was just using a generic name. Sorry, Jim Smith. That's a great name, Jim Smith. Um, yeah, I wanted to go to you 
when we were discussing earlier, you had mentioned how much when you got to ESPN, you had met people who were able to get involved through NABJ, NAHJ, these, these organizations that had their representatives moving around the country, but not so much in communities that may deserve it, right? And that could be for a number of reasons, but I guess my question to you would be, you know, if you have to play the blame game, are they to blame for, for not trying harder to reach out to the communities that may be underrepresented and by extension to kids that may not see familiar faces at all and still trying to break out into media careers? Um, I think it starts with the university. Um, honestly, like there's so many organizations and ethnic organizations that are out there to help students of color. Um, NABJ was something that I had no idea about when I, while I was here. Um, and I'm not sure if that's any fault of the universities per se. Uh, you know, we're a very, it's a very, it's a very small university and uh, the black community here is even smaller than that. So um, I'm not sure, I can't really say who's to blame for it, but we can, we can circumvent that, we can f fix that now. You know, understand what I'm saying? There's an organization called NABJ, it's NAHJ for Hispanic Journalists. There's uh, the, I believe it's the Asian American Association of Journalists, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. These are organizations that help um, put people at the forefront. These are the organizations that help get um, students jobs and get them moving up the ladder. You know, understand what I'm saying? So uh, I think it was very important for, for, for me, um, even like while I was at ESPN, just learning, learning that everybody, a lot, of the, a lot of my friends had gotten jobs through these platforms. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, I feel like for a small school with such a rich history, we really have a presence there. We have a very rich history for broadcasting and media in this, in this university. That don't, don't understate that. You know, there's a lot of history that comes here, so it's important for us to at least invoke ourselves. And, you, and honestly, the internet is, is your oyster. If you guys can just go up and sign up for NABJ or any of these organizations, it, the internet's there. You can sign up for, they have student discounts and things of that nature to just get you in the door. And when you go to these conferences, and you know, make, make yourself available and make yourself known, you know, favor will, will find you. So um, as any organization, you know, we, we talked about sports being white and male. These people in the C-suites, they, um, they pull people up that they're indeed endeared to, that they identify with, that they see some of themselves into, in, in rather. So it's the same thing at NABJ. There are, there are many people who are in higher positions, C-suite positions that you know, you'll know you meet, and if, if you're endeared to them, they will show you favor. So it's important for us to get out there into these organizations. It, it, like I said, it would, it'll just make everything better and just more efficient for us. You bring up the idea of executives at the C-suite level that may be bringing up people that they know, right? that they adhere to, that they recognize. And so the organizational element of sports media certainly comes into question often when we talk about representation. Donna and Morgan, you both work now in environments that involves dealing with not just representation, but a lot of people that may never be front facing when you think of sports media, right? Amongst them, have you seen the conversation shift where they're now aware that they have to take those steps to, to help people, to help communities rec see recognizable faces that may also then encourage better sports coverage for their communities. Absolutely, I'm gonna switch it a little bit from sports because I was heavily involved when I was the deputy public information officer for a sheriff's office. Most recently, I undertook the recruitment aspect of corrections. And we know nationally that policing and corrections is going through huge leaps and bounds of changes. And for me, undertaking the recruitment aspect of things, we were, asking, we were identifying what is the percentage of, what is this racial breakdown, what is the gender breakdown of different applicants, and what we saw was that how do we get the people of color, how do we get more women to just apply, and these aren't things I have answers to, I, I don't know, but I think that these conversations are happening, which I think is great. And mm -hmm. one thing that the department I was with did is we took a recruitment video and we translated it into six different languages because we recognized that Lowell, Massachusetts has one of the highest Cambodian populations in the country. So most of them, their first language, their second language is not English. So they're speaking Chinese. There are Haitian Creole people who are speaking Haitian Creole and Spanish. And then you have um, Portuguese, there's an extremely high Portuguese population in the state of Massachusetts, and you just have to reach these communities, and as long as I think you're making the effort, and again, those conversations are happening, and the recognition is starting, I don't know what the answer is, but I think continuing to try to get into those communities, and when it goes towards storytelling, no one tells the story of a community better than someone from that community. 
That's why as a reporter, when you go to find a source for a story, you're finding someone who's from that community, someone who is directly impacted by that story. So I just think that if you can really just get that push to tell authentic stories, hire authentic people, and let people who have the skill set come in. Um, I just, I love the quote from Ellen Pompeo, who plays Meredith Grey. She said in an interview that she wants to be surrounded by people on her crew that look like her neighbors. She wants to see people on her crew that she sees when she's walking down the street, whether, you know, they're all walks of life. She wants to see them. And I, I love that. I just think that that's so great. And I hope that that's, you know, as we get into um, further conversations, that this just keeps happening. For me, it's a little bit different. I'm sitting on my fat butt in Florida, retired right now. So I don't, I'm not hiring people and I'm not in a hiring situation and I haven't worked full time mm -hmm. for five years. But I will tell you, even back when I worked at the NBA, which was in 2000 to 2010, under da Commissioner David Stern, it was a huge issue to have a diverse workplace. I was so impressed and proud to work there because he said, we're going to reflect, to your point, we're going to reflect every neighborhood that we're in. Mm -hmm. And it was HR, or the people group as it was known, had to hire a diverse group. A little less so at World Wrestling Entertainment because it was based in Stamford, Connecticut, and it was hard to get a diverse group to work in Stamford, Connecticut. It's in the middle of Nowheresville. But HR worked for me, and it was something we put down on paper, and we said, we're going to try our hardest. So I do think, to everybody's point here, it is a huge issue now. It is an issue that is much more top, it's a focus, and, and hopefully it's getting better. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I think so. I mean, we brought up examples of the worst kinds, the best kinds of representation that we may have seen across. Community is a word that has been thrown around in this discussion quite a bit. Ade, I wanted to go to you next. Beyond Lights, a CBS sports series where it, it touches on the athletes, like I mentioned before, that come into sports where they may be unrepresented. You're taking them and you're highlighting them, not just for who they are, but for the work that they're doing to make sure they are no longer underrepresented. And so the community comes up often, often with them. What have you seen from not just the athletes, but the people around them in terms of the reception that's possibly happened, and then with the athletes too, what they're trying and just how much it's succeeding? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, last year, 2021, I created and produced and got greenlit a show called Beyond Limits that aired on CBS Sports, and we just wrapped up season two, so uh, happy for that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the concept of the show is really just to um, highlight athletes that are excelling in spaces that are traditionally underrepresented, and Yao was one of the producers of this show as well, so uh, we really wanted to just hone in on certain sports that we saw that there wasn't many representation. And it's all about seeing people that look like you perform something. So how else can you know that it's possible for you to do something if you don't have an example? So some of the athletes that we highlighted were uh, athletes of color that you know, were golf or ice hockey or water polo, various sports. And, and it wasn't just about their success. They were also reaching back into the community as well to say, hey, I know that I'm somebody who has made it and has performed at a high level at this sport that has maybe 1% people of color. So for example, we had Ashley Johnson who was on the US Olympic water polo team. And water polo, if uh, many of you know, is uh, not much diversity in that sport and 1% actually is a black population, uh, participation in, in water polo in NCAA. And she's somebody who took it upon herself to create a coalition it's called the uh, Alliance of, of Diversity and, and Equity, sorry, for World Polo. And then we also had uh, Cameron Champ from the PGA Tour who started a foundation in the name of his grandfather, Mac Champ. And that foundation provides lessons, golf lessons, to the underserved youth in the Houston area. And he also created a scholarship for Prairie View A&M for their golf program, which is HBCU. So these athletes are not just performing well, but they're putting their money where their mouth is to reach back into the community to you know, make sure that they're not the only ones moving forward to try to really grow the game. And I think that uh, it means more you know, when a person of your own kind, of your own likeness reaches back because you know, they know that you've been in their shoes before. Um, and it's something that I've seen these athletes take a lot of pride in, not just their success, but they take equal pride as to make sure that they're 
their civic engagement is, uh, is something that's a top priority to them. So I definitely have come across that. And those are the stories that we've tried to tell uh, throughout, this, throughout this show. You got to give them the plug as to when the show airs a day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we just wrapped up season two, but the show was airing, would air Saturdays uh, before our coverage of college football. So it would be generally Saturdays at 2 o'clock before college football. And there'll be re airs all over CBS Sports Network as well. You know, That's right, re airs on CBS Sports Network if you have that, if you have cable, beyond limits. As a fellow uh, Paramount Plus benefiter, because I also work at a CBS station, I uh, mm -hmm. have to co sign that plug there. Um, <laughs> The conversation has evolved around this panel, around our experiences, our examples that we've seen and the work that we've done. But a question for all of you. I'm curious, how has covering your communities and being around the people that you've been around changed how you look at the conversations that are happening nationally around diversity, around representation? Because there are phrases and buzzwords thrown around that can always tackle against it, almost like whataboutisms, right? But how have you seen the focus on representation and the good that it's done when you do focus on it? Well, I think part of what you see is just the work product and the people that are there, mm -hmm. that are present. And you know, my last full-time job was at Tough Mudder, and it was a very diverse marketplace, again, I mean a diverse workplace, mm -hmm. because it was important to the founders. And it makes a difference. It, you feel good about it. You're happy to say you work there. I work in a diverse marketplace. I mean, it was simple for me. This was a really great place to work. I was the oldest person there. I have to say it again. I was the only person who never did a Tough mutter. <laughs> I will not do that in the mud. But, but, but they, they had to have somebody old, so I was part of the diversity there. Mm -hmm. But it really, to be able to say you work in a diverse marketplace, and as you bring people in, when you interview them for positions, it's really important to be mm -hmm. able to say that. Mm -hmm. I think it's huge. Um, when I was at ESPN, uh, you know, we, I was there in 2005, and you know, we were trying to uh, have an initiative of hip-hop music, you know, just to be more prevalent at the network, and we were shot down all the time. You know, I was, I'm a rapper myself, for those who don't know, but I've, I've done rap content for a lot of um, other networks. But, you know, when we were pitching this type of content to them in, the, in 2005, 2008, 2009, whatever the case may be, got shut down at the door. But um, now when you look at the spectrum of all sports, you can't turn the TV on without hearing hip-hop music, right? So we're, at the very least, and that's part of, that's part of our culture, and it's part of um, the imprint we've, we've put on culture, right? So it's been good to see that that progression, I think, Networks are being a little more deliberate about putting us to the forefront, and you know we have some we have something to say, we have something to add creatively. So, um, like I said, it's been good for them to embrace us in that respect. Like I said, more work needs to be done, but at least we are we've, we're breaking ground. Yeah. Go ahead, Ade. Yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, y'all can attest to this that at our workplace, you know, a show like Beyond Limits never existed, but it became a possibility because of the you know embracing of culture. Uh, race and culture, not just with people of color, but women as well, too. So there's definitely uh, improvements on leaning into uh, the misrepresented uh, spaces that, mm -hmm. that have existed for a long time. Yeah. And Morgan, to end off with you. I think it's really important to, as someone who grew up in the Northeast, came back, lives here now, lived somewhere that was very different. And that's something that I really do encourage everyone in the room to try to do, whether it's traveling or moving somewhere new, getting out of your comfort zone, you meet so many people from so many different walks of life. And it's very eye-opening to see the faces of who is in different communities and being able to connect with them and just recognizing that there are issues per se maybe, or just there are things that are important to other areas of the country and people who come from different backgrounds. Um, when I was out in Idaho, it was there's a very high uh, Native American population, which was very eye-opening, and just to see the camaraderie of how they conduct themselves, like at high school basketball games, it's so unique. And then coming back to the Northeast and just seeing the diversity of the state of Massachusetts and just knowing when I was doing recruitment, I had no idea that the city of Lowell has such a high Chinese-speaking population. And it's just so interesting to, to know that their priorities are a little bit different. So 
I just encourage everyone to go someplace new with just an open mind and ask questions, have conversations like we're having now with people who are different than you because you're gonna walk away learning something new and I've learned so much from the three people up here today and other students that I've talked to and other career connectors and I'm just so thankful that the school does this because every year that I've attended as a student and been back this year, I have gained invaluable experience. Yeah, definitely, certainly to amplify Morgan, I agree with that same statement. And touching on conversations, thank you again for allowing us to have this conversation. And now we're going to move on to a phase of allowing the students to take part in this conversation too and have some questions. So I believe we're going to move on to the Q&A section. Um, I believe we have our first question as well from, from a student. I can just go. So, so my question is addressing how sports media tends to tarnish certain athletes' um, image due to, you know, if they get arrested or something, and they talk about how all the bad things they do, but they don't really talk about the things that happen after. For an example, Amani Bates a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago got arrested for having a gun in his car, but all sports media was saying how his career is over and how, you know, he's making a mistake, but a lot of sports media didn't really talk about how it was his friend's car and how he'd even realized the gun was in the car. So my question for you guys is how sports media can do a better job in representing unrepresented players, just like, you know, young black athletes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Appreciate that. And just be honest, like, it sucks to say, but drama, people love drama. Negativity is what gets headlines. Positivity doesn't get the headlines. And, and that's unfortunate but that's how things are. Um, and a lot of times people want to be first, so they don't get the whole story because they're so focused on being first instead of being right. I don't know when it happened, but there was a shift in philosophy. And not, it's not important to, okay, we get the story right and we're on point. It's, you know, some people feel like they have to be first and unfortunately that comes at the expense of some people's reputations. Uh, and some people are able to recover and bounce back and move on to better things, and unfortunately, it's not the case with some others, but that definitely is an issue for sure, and I think it's because of that rush to want to be first, especially in the, in the uh, Twitter age as the way things are right now. I think that also goes back to the represent, re representation uh, part of this we were discussing as far as media members that look like the people they're covering. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, um, if an athlete gets in trouble, um, you know, I, let me let me let me backtrack. So a few weeks ago, I had to shoot a video in New York City. For those who are familiar, there's a whole bunch of just abandoned buildings in New York City you can go to, and you know people won't bother you. But it's obviously trespassing rules and, and that type of that type of thing. So we we've always discussed discussed having police in our areas that look like us, so it'd be easier to police, right? So um, you know we're walking up the stairs, barbed wire, and, you know, it's, it does, we're not supposed to be there. But we decided to take, you know, as, as a videographer, you got to take the, take the chance and get the video because for, for the look. Uh, a police officer who I think was Dominican walked over and kindly asked, hey, what are you guys doing? You guys okay? I just want to make sure nothing crazy is going on. Uh, I've been in situations in the opposite where it was, as a, it was a Caucasian police officer who just said, get off the property, no excuse, you know, didn't even try to listen to us or hear us out. So I think just to correlate that with, um, media and athletes, like I said, if we had more media members who were covering these athletes, um, maybe it wouldn't be as, it wouldn't look as bad, or maybe they would try to do their best to get the whole story before they put out the story. Um, it, you know, af athletes get a bad light just a lot of times for even the people they hang out with, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we, like I said before, we, do, we don't really know the athletes top to bottom. It just might, might be wrong place, wrong time, but I think it's important for us as media members to do the work and really like, like Dave said, some, somewhere it changed. We have to get back to putting the entire truth out uh, when we put these stories out about these athletes in particular. And the other thing is that the majority of these athletes, not all of them, have representation. The representation have PR arms to it. They've got to do a better job coming back with the right story. What's the real story? What's the true story? Now, there are times when there is nothing good you can say. There was a time when I was at wrestling where one of the wrestlers, Chris Benoit, killed his family members. There is nothing good you can say about that. You have to be honest and you go out with it. But in cases where the story is not the whole story, that is up to the leagues, the teams. They have to be able to try to 
cut that person off from being the first person and tell the real story. I think how that affects local news and local journalism. I was very fortunate that I built a lot of relationships with county elected officials, judges, lawyers, assistant district attorneys, district attorneys, and adopted the crime beat when I was on the news side of things. And I did that and was able to build and maintain these relationships because I was notorious for following up. You'd get that first affidavit, you would get that press release of this arrest, you'd get the mugshot, you throw it up for your VO for your six o'clock news, and then what? What if information changed? What if this person was found innocent, but all that's out on the internet is the fact that they were arrested for this crime? So I think it's, if you're going the journalistic approach, it's having the integrity to continue to follow up and not feel okay just to get that headline and that first push of news out there. You have to come back and follow it up with the whole story. Certainly, and to echo that, the framing of how you cover certain stories matters too. And I encourage all of you students as well, when you read on news articles or when you read other pieces of media, try to understand how they frame certain things before you dive into the story itself or as you're diving into the story itself. I believe we have another question ahead as well. Uh, just first off, thank you guys for being here. Um, my question has to do with the coverage of women's sports. We're starting to see a lot more individual superstar female athletes like Sabrina and Ionescu in uh, the WNBA or in your neck of the woods, WWE, we're seeing women superstars headline pay-per-views. Um, but going back to the WNBA, they're not only just not getting the coverage that they deserve, they're not even being mentioned on you know, big time TV shows like ESPN First Take. It'll be the WNBA Finals and they won't even be mentioned. What do you guys think the solution to this is and do you believe that they're not being included in these shows simply because the ratings aren't there or simply because the producers don't care about women's sports? Well, it's partially what I said before. They, I don't want to use the expression they don't care, but it goes to the bottom of their list. Mm -hmm. And if the consumer is not going to know who the WNBA player is because there's not enough money behind it to support the, the camera angles aren't as good because they just don't have as many cameras there or the sponsorship isn't there, so nobody knows who this person is. That makes it really hard to support the WNBA players. But, but on conversely, it's like I said before, it's up to the NBA to do a better job of getting them front and center. And I know they're trying. Listen, the league is now almost 30 years old. Um, I was there the day it started. And you know, it continues to be a little bit of an uphill battle, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was initially. So step by step, you know, they're trying. Um, I was always, I'm, I feel like, and I've heard this before, but I'm not sure how true this is. You can, we, we can fact check this, but um, it's tough because I think the WNBA, I think the NBA takes a loss because of the WNBA every year, right? So just from a business standpoint, it's just really tough to put more money into something that's not making money, any money, more money back for you. There's no return on investment, right? So um, it's a very slippery slope. I'm not sure how to, how to promote it better, but I know for me, and I'm a, I'm a huge hoop fan, so whenever hoops is on, whether it be NBA, college, women's, if it's on, I'm gonna watch. I spend a lot of summers watching WNBA basketball just because it's on and I'm a fan of the game. Um, maybe, maybe in some respect, if you just get j just the genuine fan of the game, maybe attack that market, maybe things will start to materialize, but it's just a tough slope right now with the WNBA. Yeah, and they give away a lot of tickets to organizations because they want kids, especially young girls, to come in and be able to experience it, but that's it. I mean, the money is not there like it is for the NBA, and so it, it's tough. But they, look, I will give them credit. They have not killed it. It's 30 years, and it has not made money. And certainly when you keep in mind about the WNBA specifically, but by extension all women's sports, um, the athletes on the other side, the, the, me the men, right, they understand that their counterparts are incredibly skilled. Um, so I encourage you as fans of sports um, and fans of those sports leagues, like recognize that the talent is there. You may not find it exciting, but the athletes certainly do understand that uh, the skill level is the equivalent of it. Um, I believe we have another question as well being lined up. Um, again, thank you all so much for this conversation today. Hi, hi. Um, hello. I have a, hello, hi everybody. I have a question, it's, because it, it was talked about mental health earlier and then sports and media and I don't see where 
media and sports, they're separated. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, if I'm not playing a sport, I don't know what's going on in the sports world. And I was wondering how, how much the media affects mental health of the individual players and how it plays into the story that we hear um, and the stories of the actual athletes, male, female, whatever, diversity, any country, nation in the world where, like how, what, what's, cov what's being covered and what's being said and where m me media affects us. How, how do you think like the media can better do for humanity and sports, the, the humans that are playing sports? So, so from my understanding, you're, you're asking how uh, sports media affects the people that they cover, right? The athletes. The actual, what, who, like who are watching, who are so excited to, right? Be, okay, like okay. what? Yeah. Gotcha. So, just to chime in on the answer, I mean, you know, being in NFL locker rooms, I had the privilege of doing so for my job. Um, you would see the reactions of athletes when they knew it was time for a scrum. And if you've never been in a scrum, it's essentially just a bunch of people piling on top of each other, sticking a mic or a camera in front of an athlete's face, right? So there are certain things that athletes have to do because they're contractually obligated, media obligations, but they also understand that a layer of it is feels inhumane. And I think through your experiences, you've seen, right, just through personal experiences, it's refreshing to see athletes that, uh, okay that are being treated like people, right, that are given the space and are, are given the platform to speak about what they care about. And I believe that can be done more so if, if you guys wanted to chime in about that too. I think some of the analysts, I don't know if you guys watched First Take and um, Undisputed with Skip Bayless, a lot, of these, a lot of these pundits are very, very critical. Um, you know, we had an issue with Skip Bayless when he was calling Russell, was it Russell Westbrook. You know, calling people out of their name, and he was calling, uh, I forgot what he called Chris Bosch, but, um, you know, the, they're very harsh. And um, as we get older, we, we you know, um, we're, you know, athletes are have, supposed to have this tough skin, you know, and, you know, they're supposed to be, you know, stone cold and not, nothing's supposed to affect them. But that's just not, not the reality. They're still human beings at the end of the day. So um, I think we have to, not, I don't want to mince words, but we have to be critical of the athletes because there's so much money involved and, and you know, there's so much attention on athletes. So we have to be critical when, you know, they're not playing well. But there's tact in any, anything you can do. Um, you don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be uh, necessarily, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me out again. No? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You don't, like, you don't have to kiss their ass. But, but you don't have to kiss their ass. But you do have to co cover them fairly. And you know, like I said, players have bad days too. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean they're the worst player in the world. But that's how we spun it a lot of these athletes, like the way they cover LeBron, like, oh, LeBron, sometimes LeBron might pass the ball for a last second shot and all of a sudden he's, he's not a top 10 player anymore. These, these are the type of things that they have to go through and deal with on a daily basis. Aside, you know, their kids and their family have to hear this stuff too. Their kids are in school and they have to argue with friends about their father's performance from the night before. It's, it, it, it could be a little, a lot. It could be very, very, very um, damning and very hurtful. So, uh, like I said, for me, as I get older, I just want people to show more grace to human beings as, as a whole. And some players are just better at it than other players are. So I think back to my days at the NBA. You can put a mic in front of Magic Johnson anytime, and he will answer the questions appropriately, happy, smiling. I mean, he's just that kind of person. Michael Jordan wasn't that way. And imagine Michael getting bombarded after every game. He would say, you know, depending which PR firm was there or the, his PR guys, keep them away from me. And maybe he had a great game, but he just didn't want to deal with it. Now, to your point, they have to do it in more cases than not. Michael Jordan was able to tell us he didn't want to do it, and we said, okay, you don't have to do it. He was a little bit different. But, but it is, again, some players are better at it than others, but they're people. Give them a break sometimes, and the media just doesn't like to do that. And I think, uh, just to piggyback on what they both said, that uh, we live in a microwave media age. You know, you got these daily shows, and they have to fill content. So, you know, maybe 90% of what they're saying is not, you know, tr not good, it's trash. But they're doing that because they have to fill three hours of content five days a week. And it's not to make excuses, but I think that's maybe the rationale. Um, and as far as how it affects the athletes, you know, some athletes just block it out completely. But then other athletes, 
they call them on the nonsense, like a Draymond Green, he, he'll, what he says is the new media, that we have to hold these analysts accountable for some of the things that they say. So it's really about up to who the athlete is. Some use it as motivation, some call it out, and some people just flat out ignore it. But uh, there definitely needs to be some sort of sensitivity when it comes to if an athlete has a bad game. And you know, like I mentioned before, it's all about people wanting to be entertained and they think that these athletes are just machines and robots, but they, they aren't at the end of the day. It's yeah. really, you know, sometimes it, I cringe at some of the things, the headlines that I see when an athlete has a, a, has a bad game. Thank you for all those answers, and, and more not to cut you off, but this conversation has been excellent. I mean, going back to representation for the example, it's, it's important to realize that when you have people that look like you, the coverage looks better because you understand the backgrounds of it. And I recall seeing examples, as all of these people have here, but I want to end things on the word conversation. We have all, like I started earlier by saying, this conversation is simply just an extension of what's being done on a national level. And whether it's being done correctly or not is still up for judgment. Um, but you can determine that judgment by also taking action yourself. You can have these conversations yourself within your classrooms, within your organizations. Think about what representation does, not just for the people that are allowed into these spots or have fought for these spots, but also the audiences that may end up watching these people and then in turn being inspired and motivated. And so in conclusion to this panel discussion, and again, thank you for all your time. I hope, uh, I hope you can walk away by just having these conversations within yourselves. And uh, hopefully we gave you some more context to build off for those conversations. Thank you. another uh, hand for our fantastic panel. I'm Dr. David Kreider, the faculty director for this year's Dr. Lewis B. O'Donnell Media Summit. I want to thank all of you for being here today to hear from this terrific panel of Oswego alumni. On behalf of the numerous students, faculty, and staff members who helped put this event together, we truly appreciate your support. I also want to thank Donna Goldsmith, Ade Lewis, Yao Afori Atta, and Morgan Rumpf for agreeing to be a part of our panel, and Alif Karim for serving as our moderator. All of us here at SUNY Oswego are extremely proud of you as our alumni, and we are grateful that you gave your time to be a part of the Media Summit. Finally, I want to thank everyone who played a part in preparing and putting on today's events. It is truly a team effort to make something like this happen, and we couldn't have done it without you. Thanks especially to our event director, uh, Jenna Wilson, Assistant Event Director, Melinda Brancato, our Chair of Communication Studies, Professor Jessica Rear, our Interim Dean of SCMA, Dr. Jennifer Knapp, SCMA Secretary Candace Rasbeck, Stephanie Folds and Laura Kelly from the Alumni Office, and SUNY Oswego's Officer in Charge, Dr. Mary Toll. Students, uh, please remember to scan the QR code on your way out of the theater, uh, if you haven't already. That's going to serve as your exit ticket to confirm your attendance to today's program. Uh, and also, please stick around for uh, the Career Connector networking event, which will begin shortly over in Tyler Art Gallery. We have a number of great alumni who would love to meet you. Thank you once again, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>